Srivastava, additional Chief Secretary of Tourism and Civil Aviation, Government of Sikkim. We also have with us Mr. Pinso Gyatso, General Secretary, Homestay Association of Sikkim. Please welcome Dr. S. Anbalagan, Chief Executive Officer, Sikkim Organic Farming Development Agency, Department of Agriculture, Government of Sikkim. Please also welcome Dr. A. H. Khan, Senior Vice President, Corporate Relations India, Regulatory Affairs and Corporate Social Responsibility, Sun Pharmaceutical Industries Limited. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Anurag Khera, Group Vice President and Head Corporate Affairs, Glenmark Pharmaceuticals Limited. Please welcome Dr. Manoj Mittal, Co-Founder and Chief Executive Officer, Vidhan Cure Healthcare LLP. We also have with us Mr. Jayanta Das, Area Director, Northeast Kathmandu, Bhutan and Darjeeling, and General Manager, Vivanta Guwahati, the Indian Hotels Company Limited. And finally, we have with us Ms. Shraddha Sharma, Member, Confederation of Indian Industry, Northeast Council. Let's all welcome them. Thank you. The involvement of such a rich panel of prominent business leaders and senior government officials provide provides an adequate expertise and legitimacy to express views of the business community and government. Thank you all very much for joining us today. I humbly request the speakers to keep your presentation brief as we are running behind schedule. As we start the session, may I invite Mr. Karma Arbonpo, Secretary, Commerce and Industries, Government of Sikkim to deliver the welcome address and share details of the investment opportunities in Sikkim with us. Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, heads of department, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives great pleasure to invite you all to this plenary session where we we'll discuss opportunities for multilateral business partnerships in tourism, hospitality, pharmaceuticals, organic farming, and other sectors which have been not uh, mentioned. I would also uh, like to express uh, gratitude to the Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji for selecting Sikkim for having a B20 as well as S20 engagement meeting. And also my gratitude to the Honorable Chief Minister of Sikkim for uh, driving this uh, particular uh, uh, engagement meeting. And also uh, most of the context has already been set by the Honorable Chief Minister as well as the uh, respected Chief Secretary of India. We will just be expanding on a few of the points. I would also like to uh, sincerely thank the CII uh, who are the main drivers behind this deep 20 engagement meeting. Uh, uh, they have uh, set out uh, that uh, they, they want to have inclusive recommendations to G20 under the theme of race, responsible, accelerated, innovative, sustainable and equitable business. As you know, I think Sikkim is at the forefront of sustainable development uh, with minimum degradation to environment. So I feel that uh, this engagement meeting will be a very fruitful one. My colleagues on the dais as well as the other speakers will be mainly focusing on the core sectors. I will, uh, with, uh, due to the paucity of time, I will just concentrate on those sectors uh, where Sikkim has immense potential uh, but has not been covered. So uh, without wasting much time and welcoming all delegates, especially from uh, other, other parts of the country as well as uh, um, um, uh, many delegates from abroad, uh, I would like to uh, just present you a brief on the investment opportunities which are available in Sikki. So may I have the presentation please? So <clears throat> uh, before going, I would like to just uh, say a few things about the small state and beautiful state of Sikki. We have a very small population of 6 lakhs. As an already outlined, our GSDP is about uh, 4 lakh 72 thousand. Literacy rate uh, closing to 97 percent. We have a small area of 7096 square kilometers. We have major towns like Gantok, Namchi, Pakyong, Gezing, Soaring, and Mangan. We have two airports, the nearest airports. One is the Pakyong airport where uh, the delegates have landed yesterday. And we have the other airport, which is Bakogra, which is about two and a half hours from Gantok. 
The nearest railhead is New Jalpai Giri. Uh, we have, uh, will be having a railhead soon, which is in Manita, which is proposed to be finished by December of 2024. And national highways, um, I would also like to say that under the current dispensation, uh, we have a huge number of national highways which are currently being constructed in Sikkim. Um, <clears throat> before uh, outlining what are the investment opportunities, I would like to steer a few brief background on the Sikkim Industrial Development and Investment Vision. This vision is a work in progress. We are still working on the policy, and P20 has come at the right time where we can still, you know, refine what is an investment vision. As I've already been chief, uh, said by the Honorable Chief Minister, we want to promote green industries because we have um, greater growth in the sense that we have a very rich biodiversity to take care. So we have the government of Sikkim has consciously made the decision saying that only green industries will be promoted. We have again sustainability goals because we want our investments to be sustainable uh, so that uh, we meet all the commitments uh, as a global family. Uh, one of the major USPs of Sikkim is peace and good governance. Uh, Sikkim has never had any trouble with uh, violence and we have no history of any violence till date. So the investments that you make will be uh, free of any geopolitical risk. We want to concentrate on high value because uh, due to the sheer size, uh, since we are a very small uh, size, we have to go for high value products. And lastly, all our investments should be tailored towards making the lives of people, uh, making the lives of people better. So most of the investments, we want to make sure that there is a local participation of people and everyone is well off. <coughs> um, I would now like to concentrate on some of the key sectors where we have a very good competitive demand uh, As you know, India's mission is 500 gigawatts of clean energy by 2030. So under that, India has made a commitment under the Paris Climate Change Agreement. We have to reduce the emission intensity by one third. We have to ensure that at least 40% of the electric power comes from renewable energy sources. We have set an ambitious target of 500 gigawatts by 2030. And in this, solar is going to play a major role. But in, for, in the context of Sikkim, we would like to focus on hydro, especially small hydro, because that is where we have a big competitive advantage. India is already emerged as a global uh, a leader in renewable energy. We are the fourth uh, in the country in terms of wind energy capacity, fourth in terms of solar energy, and third in renewable energy capacity. <coughs> now, before going, uh, we would like to see that there are a lot of disruptions, especially in clean energy. A um, um, lot of technological advancements are happening. Consumers are not only really customers, uh, they have become prosumers, they are producing. We have distributed energy generation. We are transitioning to electric vehicles. More analytics coming into cleaner energy. Um, and then <coughs> consumers also, they are equipped with latest technologies where we are smart metering, net metering, all these kind of innovations are currently happening. So in this context, I would like to explain the hydro energy potential of Sikkim. We have two major river basins. One is Tishta and Rangi. We have a potential of about 8,000 megawatt. Till date, we have commissioned 2,321 megawatt. The work in progress is about 1,037 megawatt is a work in progress. We had a potential investment of about 2,000 megawatt. Small hydro, uh, we have not carried a study, but I think uh, uh, we are estimating on the lower side. We say that we have a potential of more than 1,000 megawatt, especially in small hydro. And if you look at the power, hydropower side, where exactly, uh, what vision do we have? We have a vision to be the leader in small and micro hydro in the country for sustainable development and also meeting the clean energy requirements of the country. What are the key enablers? One of the key enablers is we have a very good precipitation in the sense that uh, out of uh, 365 days, 180 days we get precipitation. If you look at the regions uh, which get very high precipitation, it, it covers more than 60 to 70 percent of those areas. They have very good potential. So we can say we do tourism during the dry season and we do hydro during the rain season. So uh, that way, I think we have an additional sector where we can de-risk from the tourism sector. So this is again an important uh, sector where we are looking at uh, investments. <coughs> so the other thing is. One of the major enabling factors that has happened in Sikkim is that now we have got a backbone. 
We have got a transmission backbone which has been funded by the government of, uh, government of India. And due to this transmission back backbone, we can now evacuate any power which has been generated. It is connected to the national grid. So, uh, so the backbone is ready. We just need to lay the nerves. Uh, the last mile connectivity is where the, currently the power department is working on. So once we have the last mile connectivity, then it opens the entire sector to various entrepreneurs to put up the generating stations. And uh, this uh, has potential for decentralized generation. We want to go for open access for power generators. And uh, the power department is also actively undertaking power sector reforms where we will enable entrepreneurs to you know, tap into this particular potential. And this is very important because it means the clean energy obligations and sustainable uh, development commitments. <coughs> So uh, what support in hydro power sector we can provide from the state government? We can give leasehold land for manufacturing of power and hydraulic equipment. Basically, we want to encourage R&D in this particular uh, small hydro because this has immense potential. The state has a good topography, then we have a good water supply. So in hydro, it is basically uh, the amount of water as well as the height. So both of this uh, is uh, like where we have a good competitive advantage. And uh, we are encouraging, uh, especially r and institutes to more, do more research and development, especially in generating small turbines, easier to install turbines, uh, easier to hook it onto the uh, hook it onto the power transmission system, net metering, net billing, all the all the kind uh, the, uh, remote telematrics. So all these sectors can come into the state. Uh, we encourage design consultancy firms to set up so that our entrepreneurs can take advantage of the immense potential which is there in hydroelectricity. So we, we, are, we are ready to offer land, uh, we are ready to offer office space for design consulting services. We have a good qualified manpower. We have many technical institutions like SMIT, NIT, CCIT. So all this uh, where a lot of passwords can be possible, people who can be uh, directly employed in the hydroelectric uh, sector. Uh, yeah, as far as the ease of business is concerned, uh, we uh, are now working towards providing a single window clearance, time on clearance, and having a dedicated support uh, staff for onboarding the, especially the startups as well as the industry into, take, uh, into uh, uh, tapping the potential of this sector. As far as the fiscal incentives are concerned, we are now waiting for, uh, especially the DPIG, to give us the novice industrial development policy. And one recommendation that we would make is. Uh, in terms of greener energy, I think they should be more uh, supportive and more subsidy, especially in developing, because we are meeting one of the most important climate change targets. Uh, as far as the state government subsidies are concerned, we are working on providing lease rent subsidy, power subsidy, and having some stamp duty subsidies. Um, the potential areas, as I have already told, is like in turbine manufacturing, power equipment manufacturing, design consultancy, research and development, institute building around hydropower. And wh why we are pro promoting Sikkim is that we are a gate gateway to Northeast India. We have a huge potential, not only in Sikkim, the entire Northeast has a huge hydroelectric potential. We have a huge hydroelectric potential of the neighboring states, especially in Bhutan, Nepal. And Lastly, if we provide a conducive environment, maybe I think this sector is right to be harnessed because it has not been tapped. <clears throat> so the other sector that we want to focus in is to create renewable cities, especially since we have renewable power. Now we want to have uh, ensure that our cities are also well planned. We want our city to be entirely powered by 100% renewable energy. We want to provide leadership in having renewable energy and sustainable development solutions. Uh, um, UDHT is working on a proposal for Greater Gantok Renewable City. So this city is that they are already working on the master plan. So we want to develop the satellite areas, especially Ranga, Runte, Gun. And this has a potential of attracting a lot of investment, not only in infrastructure development. We have potential in real estate, um, your key parks, your tourism, hotel, commercial spaces, uh, design parks, industrial parks. And what support we re uh, require from multilateral agencies as well as uh, from developed countries is that if they can help us in designing such a city, uh, because I think um, the state government wants to take the part towards having cities which are more resilient to climate change, which are more uh, suitable uh, in the sense that which are more future ready, rather than only 
uh, most of the damages, we want to ensure that we plan such cities so that they're more resilient. Uh, the other uh, important uh, area where we are now focusing is having modernist mobility solutions. As has been already outlined by the Honorable Chief Minister that we have already commissioned one ropeway, uh, uh, newly commissioned ropeway in Bali Duga. So, given the mountainous geography, this is the fact. Hello. So, given the mountainous uh, geography, we feel that uh, this is uh, one of the most economically sustainable alternate transport uh, medium, especially in mountainous regions. This will help us connect all our remote areas in the state with minimal degradation to the environment. So, and we also, this will also promote sustainable tourism livelihood. And also for urban mobility, this is one of the, I think, enablers for you know, creating better urban uh, mobility. So the advantages are that uh, uh, we want to we want to promote Sikkim as a cable, uh, cable car manufacturing hub in the country. So we invite investment, especially in setting up, you know, uh, setting up their uh, fabrication units or uh, assembly units in the state. So again, the investment policies we are, which we are already working on, we will make it uh, much more uh, lucrative to the um, to such manufacturers who are willing to set up in the state. And uh, I would like to say that why we, we want to uh, go into a newer forms of mobility is that nowadays, I think, uh, as you know, transportation has become more of a service. So in future, as more and more we transition to electrical vehicles and uh, new mediums of mobility, so I think cable car systems in the mountainous regions make sense because they are more ecologically uh, resilient to disasters. Because if we build roads, maybe the initial cost is low. But the, the cost to maintain, the cost uh, to maintain, especially then during the rainy season, is very high. And as you know, what our advantage is in the high road, the same precipitation becomes a disadvantage for the mobility. So we have to trans transition to newer types of mobility. So we, uh, uh, urban development department is already working on the Gantok urban cable system. Uh, we are now, uh, I think, work, actively working with DPIT and other funding agencies to try to fund this particular uh, mobility solution. Uh, they propose to link the entire uh, Gantok through a network of you know, cable cars. This is very important because it will reduce not only the transportation time, it will reduce a lot of uh, carbon energy because we can power this entirely through renewable energy So, uh, and we need not be dependent on fossil fuels. And the other uh, important aspect that we want to also focus on the newer technologies is the electrical vehicle, uh, electrical vehicle ecosystem because as more and more industries are now transitioning uh, to electrical vehicles, we would like to invite uh, proposals from various countries as well as from various companies to help us achieve this particular thing. And Sikkim can be a showcase for um, a complete transition to electrical vehicle because we have a smaller population, we have a much manageable uh, a vehicle fleet, and we can be first in the country to transition to EVs. So this is again one sector that we are actively considering, and we are trying to see how we can encourage manufacturers, especially in electrical vehicle components. We can uh, also electrical vehicle charging. Uh, we, we don't want. Uh, uh, we want to uh, generate that ecosystem, especially uh, given the incentives which are being promoted by TIT and given the incentives which are around uh, having newer mobility solutions, I think Startup 20 also, we want to take the backing and help us guide us in how we can uh, promote this kind of uh, industry in Sikkim. Uh, the other sector where we have a very, very uh, good competitive advantage is in the creative sector. We want to be the design capital of uh, India. Why is that possible? Because we have a very rich talent pool of creative professionals. As you go around Gantok, you will get enough idea that the amount of creative potential ready to explore. We, uh, you, you can see in the beautiful way in which the entire G20 things were designed. So that shows the amount of potential that uh, the people of the state has, especially in, in terms of design. We have a very rich uh, culture and art. We have a rich talent pool of IT and ITS uh, um, yeah, professionals. Uh, which type of industries are suitable. We want industries, especially in industrial product design, automotive uh, um, um, design, then we have animation, VFX, uh, all film industries, media industries. These have a lot of uh, scope, especially in setting up in Sikkim. And what are the enablers? Uh, we are in the process of uh, making a proposal for setting up a design path. 
and uh, we want to give uh, space to any investors uh, wishing to set up in uh, the state of Sikkim. So the, uh, as has already outlined a lot of uh, communications, climate change and biotech biotechnology, why Sikkim? Because we have uh, the Kansanagar National Biosphere Reserve, which is the world's 31st biodiversity hotspots. It has a very rich biodiversity. We have 5,000 species of flowering plants, 550 orchids. We have a lot of species of birds, uh, snow leopards, endangered animals. And uh, due to climate change, uh, uh, this region has become very vulnerable in the sense that we, there is an effect on glaciers, there is a potential effect on plants. The potential areas of engagement where we want to have, especially G2G, is we need to save it, and it's a collective responsibility. It is not the responsibility only of the state. We encourage the central government, we encourage the multilateral, uh, even the multilateral organizations, as well as uh, multi government organizations, to help us save this. Because this has a rich gene bank, and if we don't initiate any uh, measures uh, to protect this, because as a developing uh, uh, country, we have limited resources where we can uh, safeguard a particular. Uh, uh, safeguard a particular biodiversity, so we would like to have uh, partnerships with other developed nations to help us conserve this, especially in establishing research and development, especially in understanding the risk because uh, documentation right from you know conservation, this requires a lot of effort and we require that kind of support. We want to set up uh, R&D institutes in Sikkim, we want to set up institutes in Sikkim, especially in the conservation of this particular uh, biodiversity, because once it is lost, it is the humanity, uh, it will lose it forever. So please, um, I, I think uh, this can be an important uh, uh, policy initiative for, of this particular forum, where we invite your support in order to conserve uh, our rich biodiversity. So the other sector that has again an immense potential is the handloom, handicraft and textile sector. Why? Because we have a very vibrant uh, cottage industry. This cottage industry provides direct employment to the artisans. We have five ma uh, major handloom deal and deal customers uh, clusters. We have a good and well-trained artisans. The products that we produce currently are woolen carpets, hanga painting, wood furniture, bamboo products. The export potential is there especially to develop markets where they can generate higher remuneration. And in this also, what collaboration we can have is we, uh, we are now looking at new technology to make it less um, less um, labor intensive and, and so that uh, this cost we can manage. So as I have outlined, the health and wellness uh, industry is again an important sector. Uh, it has been covered in detail in the uh, presentation of the uh, respected chief secretary, we are looking at uh, uh, having uh, investment, especially in hospitals uh, and associated uh, industries, especially in medical uh, medical industry. Uh, we have a huge talent pool in the sense that many youths can be trained in hospital and wellness, and we can leverage tourism and hospitality because they, these seems to be complementary industries. And the pharma industry, I will just give an overview. The details will be covered by the uh, representatives from the pharma industry. Uh, we have uh, currently more than 50 pharma companies who have uh, set up. Uh, so this has been po possible due to a conducive uh, uh, policy environment and we still want to promote this particular sector. Uh, <coughs> so lastly, in order to build an enabling uh, investment environment, uh, uh, we now have to have a very good education system. So in this also, we would like to enable government to go on government collaboration we want to work with various partners so that we can drive the education towards quality rather than quantity. We have to focus on higher education, especially on climate change, sustainable development, conserving the bio resources of the state, more on creative design, and, uh, newer technologies like uh, information technology, artificial intelligence, uh, medical and healthcare, and especially also develop the management and business, kind, business uh, development in, in, in our students. Uh, primary education again is the focus of uh, both the governments, but the government as the center as well as the state. Uh, we are looking at more holistic education, and I think uh, in this probably I think through B20, I think if you don't enable a good quality education system, then uh, we will uh, we will not be able to attract uh, the kind of uh, or the investments will not realize the true potential. So we need more investments in education sector also. So as far as uh, connectivity and infrastructure are concerned, 
So currently, the government of India is uh, giving huge emphasis to the connectivity in the northeast. We are uh, concerned. Uh, we are connected uh, through a uh, <coughs> uh, uh, through a rail network. Um, the parking airport will be functional soon. We are trying to make it operational uh, uh, throughout the year. Uh, there are some uh, improvements which are happening. Uh, we want to establish helipads across the state so that we can have sort of heli tourism. Uh, we want. Um, uh, we are in the process uh, of getting connected to the Asian highway uh, through the Act East policy. Uh, various national and state highways are being uh, constructed, and we want to go for other transportation media so that. Uh, uh, the uh, tourism sector also gets uh, uninterrupted kind of connectivity. So lastly, I would like to say that uh, our policy is concentrated on people. We strongly believe in the sustainable development goals, uh, and um, we would like to invite not only partnership in, uh, in, in industries, but people-to-people -people partnerships, so that uh, we can uh, truly realize the motto of one family, one world, one future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bongo, for your informative talk on investment opportunities in Sikkim. I once again request the speakers to kindly keep your presentation brief, not more than 10 minutes if possible, as we are already running behind schedule. We have a long list of speakers among the delegates as well. If you have prepared a long presentation, I humbly request you to kindly make it short. Thank you for your understanding. Moving forward with the session, may I now call upon Mr. ML Srivastava, Additional Chief Secretary, Tourism and Civil Aviation Department, Government of Sikkim, to share his views on the opportunities in tourism sector. Very good afternoon to all. Excellencies, Deputy Heads, Consular General, dignitaries on the dais, all the dais, all the esteemed delegates from the G20 countries for this B20 event, ladies and gentlemen. At the very outset, I thank on the behalf of the Tourism and Civil Aviation Department, uh, the Honorable Chief Minister, the Chief Secretary and the organizers of this event for giving us this opportunity to share the issues, initiatives, plans, policy, policy initiatives and interventions that we have taken in the tourism sector of the state. I am here to give inter area a general perspective of tourism in Sikkim, its historical legacy, the unique selling points, USPs, the bounties of Mother Nature Sikkim is endowed with, the policy in initiatives, investment opportunities in the <coughs> tourism sector, how state government initiatives are impacting the general masses, creating livelihoods, livelihood opportunities. <coughs> These issues I will be taking with up. <coughs> Uh, my colleague and friend, Mr. Pinsu Gyatsu, he will take up the user's perspective of the tourism in the state. So, <coughs> this uh, shloka in Sanskrit from Shubhashitan, it uh, gives the gist of tourism per se. I will not read it. I will just, since most of the issues which we have uh, taken and I am going to speak out uh, just of that, the initiatives particularly and the opportunities in the tourism sector. Most of these issues have been taken up by the uh, respected uh, Chief Minister sir and uh, the res respected Chief Secretary and of course to certain extent my predecessor, we will speak out. But I will steer you on to a kaleidoscopic view of the tourism sector, tourism scenario uh, and its perspective in the state. <coughs> uh, this I will not dwell upon. Uh, basically, the point I am making that projected tourism influx in the state is around 1.8 million uh, this year and subsequently. So, the, this gives the back, 
backdrop of tourism in the country per se and of course that is giving the advantage and the opportunity for the state of Sikkim also. The uh, expected uh, uh, growth rate of tourism is around 4.3% from uh, 21 to 27, 2021 to 27 and uh, the India's planning commission, the Niti Ayo, identified tourism as the second largest provider of employment of to low and semi skilled persons. And annual growth, growth rate of tourism industry in India is predicted to, to be around 8.8 percent. So this particularly is the backdrop of this tourism and the opportunities there. Now I will uh, uh, take up, as I mentioned to you, that the historical legacy and how we can leverage that in the tourism sector. Uh, you know that uh, Sikkim is, uh, was a monarchy, a country, and that uh, joined the Indian Union in 1975. So this historical legacy is also of vast tourism, tourism in, uh, impact, and it has a tourism element in it. Uh, you know that the old silk group also, uh, the old trade group with the Tibet, uh, uh, was prevailing and this is also there in the East uh, Gangtok district at, at present. It is also of tourism importance and two to three days can take up to traverse this and there are uh, requisitions for traversing this area, this uh, uh, city. I mentioned this, uh, I will not dwell upon that. Now the vision of the tourism department, definitely, to provide a responsible tourism destination the tourism sector contributing significantly to the state economy linked to the opportunities, livelihood opportunities. As the Chief Secretary already had mentioned that 20% uh, of the um, population of the state is involved in the tourism sector. <coughs> now the strengths, I, I mentioned about the USPs, so I will not read each one of that. Most of these are already said and uh, for, first fully of certified organic state strong social infrastructure, a well-developed uh, fiscal infrastructure, but then capita income from the highest in the country. So these are the USPs of the state that gives uh, a very sound uh, backing for the growth of the tourism sector in the state. Uh, in, the city, in the state of Sikkim, again, various thematic uh, verticals are there. I will not read. These are populated there. Nature-based tourism, religious tourism, adventure tourism, and rural and cultural growth. So all the four sectors we are working on and these have very high potential and the growth in each of these sectors is really phenomenal. Uh, the tourism investment policy which we have drafted and submitted, so uh, we are focusing on, of course, ecotourism as we have all uh, learned and seen that uh, in Sikkim it is a the biodiversity hotspot and various other, it has one fourth of the biodiversity of the country, biodiversity hotspot of the world per se. Wellness tourism, mice tourism is another sector where conferences and exhibitions and meetings for that we have to develop the infrastructure. Uh, here I invite the August uh, presence here that they should invest in these, this, this particular area. Now, film tourism, as we all know that Sikkim has been declared as the best uh, film destination in the country. Educational tourism, we have a very vast network of universities here and skill universities. Uh, so, there is a very vast scope of educational tourism also. Karma tourism is a new concept and we are building on it and we are integrating this with the other states, other northeastern states particularly uh, for development of this Karma tourism. Now, I will not go in detail with the tourist footfall. You can see it here. During the two uh, uh, years of the COVID-19, uh, otherwise the, it, it does around 16, 1.6 million and the projected growth as this year is around 1.8 million. Uh, now, <coughs> domestic tourists and foreign tourists, these are depicted there. So, we have, uh, there are three seasons. So this seasonality of the tourism, we also have to address. So we have to stagger, and as uh, the Chief Secretary mentioned in the morning session, that we have to make the tourists stay longer in the state. That is the objective. So 
to uh, address that objective, we have to address this seasonality issue that tourists should also be coming in the so-called non-peak seasons also. So as of now, uh, the tourist influx during the uh, mid-seasons or even green seasons, particularly mid-season and peak season, it is almost very high influx. Uh, second natural infograph, I will not dwell upon that. Again, I mentioned that uh, it is Sikkim has 47.6% of the forest cover, one of the highest in the country, and uh, very wide biodiversity, biodiversity hotspot, the country six static biodiversity hotspots in the world, it is one of them, Eastern Himalaya, and uh, very vast change in a very short span, from 300 meters to going to 8,600 or <coughs> in a very short span. So that's why there is very strong uh, change of the biological geographical zones. That's why there is very high biodiversity is there. So I will again not uh, read everything here. Uh, now these are the four, uh, the state butterfly, state flower, state bird and the state animal. So <coughs> continuing in the National Park again, Mills Heritage 2016, only one Mills Heritage site in the country, only one. and. Uh, a major tourist destination. We have uh, developed trekking trails. So this is one of the nature-based tourism, trekking trails to uh, Choka and Jongri Trek. So this is uh, in between the Choka is there. Uh, now our dancing base camp, Yuxong, Guchara Trek route. So <coughs> trekking trails we have developed in the particularly in the Kanchanjaka National Park around 140 kilometers trails have been developed outside also 80, 90, 80, 85 kilometers have been developed. So we are taking up new trekking routes and those have been already um, uh, identified and we are working on that. Then in this tourism we all know that Sikkim is part of the eastern Buddhist circuit and very strong presence of the Buddhist community here, followers and all uh, sects of the Buddhism they have their followers here and the monastery there. So <coughs> you can see, uh, it was mentioned, one of the most important monastery in the world, Rumtek Monastery and others. Uh, what makes Buddhist, uh, um, Buddhist pilgrimage uh, to Sikkim very so, so very special? So <coughs> uh, it is uh, mentioned here, again, uh, you have seen major tourist sites the Samdukchi, the Buddha Park, the Cherizin, and the Belen. So we have a lot of uh, religious uh, uh, infrastructure and that is uh, leading to this, and, uh, particularly religious infrastructure, Char Dham in uh, Namchi. Uh, major monasteries, Buddha Park I have already mentioned. Namdel Institute of Tibetology, why I have uh, put it here? that it is propagating Sova Rikpa, it is a Tibetan medicine and Sova Rikpa, the government of India also took it up as an element of the intangible cultural heritage of the UNESCO. So in that sense it is very important and NIT is uh, doing research and uh, working in the field of Sova Rikpa. So sacred lakes, as it is mentioned, the lakes are sacred, uh, might be Kanchanjanga, it is uh, Gajan deity. <coughs> glimpses of monastic dances. Uh, adventure tourism has a lot of potential in the state. Uh, trekking, mountaineering, all these adventure tourism, we have taken it up. We have a national institute here under the uh, Department of Tourism. <coughs> Paragliding, expeditions. Uh, trekking, I have already mentioned that we have uh, taking up new trekking uh, routes and uh, these are one of the best trekking routes, I can say that. And if properly advertised and adopted, the tourism in Sikkim will, will go leaps, leaps and bounds. Uh, mountain biking, these are all part of it. Now this rural tourism is very important, rural and homestays. So, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, we got this feedback that people are preferring to stay in the uh, rural areas, to stay in the, go in the, for the homestays rather than staying in the five-star hotels. Even people prefer that because they come here for that experience. Uh, around 1194 uh, registered uh, homestays are there and uh, further the uh, numbers will be added. 
Uh, rich cultural heritage, we have already talked about that, very uh, intermingling of the different cultures, but unique Sikkimese identity they are preserving. So this embraces their diversity and it preserves their identity. Uh, folk dances, very colorful, very wide, very and local cuisines, you know, I mean, these are now a universalization of the, the secondary school cuisines. You can get momos or these tukpa uh, and these things and anywhere in the world for that. Right. Uh, arts and culture, very important area and uh, of high value. Uh, the ankas, the, the handicrafts and habitats. <coughs> now, this is the area, opportunities in Sukhya Round trip train tourism for Northeast. This is one area because the uh, train uh, connectivity is going to be operational with it from next year. So uh, we plan to have uh, one go uh, to the train on the whole Northeast and we will integrate with the Northeast. Sikkim has one hop destination. Uh, many tourists, even the, the government of India scheme of international Uran is there. So we have um, submitted the voice, our requirement to, for better connectivity from Paro, I mean Bhutan, uh, Pakyong, Nepal, Kathmandu, Pakyong, and further to Dhaka, Pakyong. So once this is done, so the tourists coming to these areas, they can come to Sikkim as one of destination, move around, and then get back. Uh, my tourism, I have already mentioned, rural tourism, they are, I have already given the form. <coughs> Wellness tourism, very strong medical infrastructure is already there, so it can be a catchment. Uh, in uh, Sikkim can, uh, will have a catchment in the uh, West Bengal or even nearby countries also. Or uh, adventure tourism, uh, I also already mentioned, very wide scope and we are working on it. And uh, entertainment parks and theme parks, also another area of development. And we are, uh, and we are being approached by different uh, developers in this regard. And uh, EV and eco-friendly transport, modes of trans tourist mobility. Our plan is, our, our aim is uh, carbon neutral tourism also. I mean, the, in the current scenario of the uh, vagaries of climate change and all that. And uh, now, I have given you a general idea of the tourism sector. What are our priorities and what we are aiming at. We are the improved, uh, we want to improve the connectivity through heliports and heliodromes. All the six districts we have already submitted to the Government of India Ministry of uh, Civil Aviation that we should have one heliport, heliodrome in each district. And they will have, I mean, multiple uh, connectivity with the Bhargogra and the So, uh, uh, I need not uh, repeat these things. Uh, Sikkim is one of the best tourist uh, destinations acknowledged by various international bodies, uh, one of the 10 best places. Uh, 17th out of 52 places by New York Times. Uh, innovative, most you know, innovative, unique tourist, uh, tourism project, this uh, situation of Chaga, I mentioned earlier. Uh, now, uh, the first fully certified, I will not speak upon. Uh, it has been already talked about so many times. Uh, now, Sikkim has won more than 30 national uh, tourism awards under different categories. And uh, uh, we recently received uh, this uh, Northeast uh, Tourism uh, Leadership Award. And the best state campaign, Clean India by Ministry of Tourism, uh, cleanest hill station uh, by India Today in 2015. Now, uh, this is one appeal or proposition, I can make it here. It's a very august gathering, representatives from all over the world. And uh, with your intervention, uh, this uh, Sikkim as a prominent potential tourism destination worldwide needs to be factored in and assimilated in the tourism ecosystems of different countries and tourism cohorts. The respected esteemed delegates present here may shoulder this responsibility and foster for fostering forging partnerships in this regard, this truly will make this summit a G20 a good will Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your valuable insights. Now I would like to call upon Mr. Pinto Gyatso, 
General Secretary, Homestay Association of Sikkim, to share some more insights on the tourism sector in Sikkim. company called our guest and uh, basically we aggregate homestays and farm stays uh, across the northeastern region of India. Uh, so I'm here today to just uh, really quickly talk about uh, the travel industry in Sikkim. Uh, I won't uh, get into details, I think a lot has been already spoken and uh, well I think uh, I'm trying to look at the journey that we've been in to get to where we are today here in the industry. Um, some of the challenges that we faced, uh, some of the challenges that of course lie ahead of us and uh, despite us being considered a fairly mature travel destination, uh, where I still do believe that uh, uh, we are only at the cusp of uh, sustainable travel. So um, yes, a quick snapshot of uh, tourism in Sikkim. Uh, I have some seniors here in the audience, I hope I do justice. Uh, so Sikkim tourism, uh, the industry uh, from the 80s and definitely well into the 90s, uh, was a fairly niche market. I do believe that there were two main factors uh, that were responsible for people wanting to visit here. Uh, definitely one was culture. Uh, when we talk about culture, it was mostly uh, uh, Buddhist and monastic treks experiences, uh, simply because uh, similar destinations like Sikkim, uh, that is like if you can, can say Bhutan or Ladakh, were not really available or not easily accessible back then. So it put us in a pretty interesting place. And uh, the other thing being definitely treks. Uh, I think high, high altitude mountain trekking in India was again at a very early stage. So with the opening up of the trek routes of the Kanjijanda Base Camp Trek, again a very unique uh, product that we had to offer. Uh, of course today we moved on a bit more towards the... I guess we can just cover that in, in the later slides a little bit. Uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, the opportunities in tourism in Sikkim. And uh, I would like to just keep my on uh, two factors or two sectors, definitely rural travel uh, with a particular focus on home stays and the other being venture tourism, uh, again a focus on trekking and mountaineering. Uh, so let us just dive in straight with home stays. What exactly is a home stay in Sikkim? Uh, basically we have a couple of rooms to let out, um, uh, you know we host, uh, provide accommodation and meals and uh, you earn a livelihood uh, for hosting. And in return, uh, what it means for the traveler is, of course, you get a very interesting insight into the ethnic culture and the food. Uh, of course, at homestays, we provide a lot of uh, experiences, uh, things like guided walks, uh, nature interpretation, uh, culinary experiences, to name a few. Uh, ticket size, I would say that on an average, a homestay in Sikkim would cost you somewhere around 3,500 uh, rupees uh, with the two major meals. So, but as you can see, there is a pretty big range of the kind of accommodation that's available in this sector, from very budget stays to pretty high-end uh, uh, boutique stays. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying that home stays is definitely at the heart of uh, uh, promotion today. Uh, we have about close to 500 home stays registered in the state. Uh, so this is where it gets a little interesting. There are some things that we've learned uh, over the time as we've explored uh, the home stay sector. Uh, the first thing is that uh, we realize that a large chunk of our visitors in Sikkim are domestic travelers, uh, Indian travelers, and they tend to be in larger groups. And even the local travel agents or the, the national, let's say, national level travel agents tend, tend to send uh, slightly larger groups. And this was a pretty unique problem for us because home stays are small. We have two rooms, four rooms at the most. Uh, so the state government um, uh, took upon itself to uh, look at a pilot. Uh, we started exploring what we call a cluster approach and definitely a is the year of the millet and uh, by the United Nations. Uh, I'm happy to see that we've been consuming the fermented form for quite a while here. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying, when we talk about homestays, uh, it lies in the heart of our push for sustainable tourism. Um, see, when we talk about accommodation units in Sikkim, a lot of the hotels tend to spring up in places which are very, uh, uh, let's say, touristy or, or in major hotspots. Homestays, on the other hand, are spread across all across the state, especially in rural areas. 
so they definitely help in dissipating the footfall over a much larger area. Uh, that definitely helps, particularly in peak season. So this is, is a much, much better model that we've noticed. Of course, it's uh, lesser construction. We are already using existing infrastructure. Um, it's definitely not capital intensive. And that's one of my favorites that anybody that has a home with extra rooms can get. And uh, yeah, what we better way to promote local coal culture and cuisine. And it is absolutely in line with the, the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals today. So a uh, quick jump into what is the opportunity of homestay and the homestay sector today. Um, I read about a, a report that uh, Airbnb, which most of you know, it's uh, probably the largest aggregator of uh, vacation rentals in the world today. Uh, their third quarter earnings for 2022, uh, more than 50% of the earnings actually came from long stays. And uh, it was also from their uh, rural listings, not even from the urban listings. So this was a keen takeaway for us also in the industry here because uh, this is something that we're looking to improve upon and work a lot more on, work from home, uh, longer stays, and uh, of course, we need to work very closely with the, with the government because infrastructure like data connectivity is extremely important for us. Uh, of course, uh, the obvious lower financial overheads, setting up a homestay and running it is fairly, uh, you know, not as challenging as large units. And of course, higher margins because we don't have salaries or uh, big manpower to pay for. So, and of course, uh, we also did notice everybody was affected in the pandemic. But um, it was interesting to see that as homestay operators, um, slightly more resilient to market disruptions. Uh, with that, I would like to jump into the second uh, uh, sector that I talked about, which is adventure tourism, and in particular, treks and mountaineering. Uh, I think uh, we've all heard about Kanchin Zonga. I hope some of you got to see some of it. Um, a quick snapshot. Uh, Sikkim, uh, trekking in Sikkim is mostly alpine style, uh, where basically it's an expedition. We carry uh, self-sufficient uh, supplies and uh, uh, waters and pack animals, and usually the preferred trek is usually a round trek or a circular trek. We start from a place and we end up in another place. Uh, as of now, we have about five peaks that are accessible for expeditions. Uh, they're somewhere in the range of 5,000 to 6,500 meters. Uh, then we also have a home to the Indian Himalayan Center uh, for Adventure and Ecotourism. So this is essentially a mountaineering institute, uh, very much here in Sikkim, and uh, a great place to train guides as well as aspiring mountaineers. Uh, and of course, we have over 50 peaks that are named. And the interesting bit comes, uh, unofficially, there are more than 150 peaks. So all within a very, very small uh, geography. So therein lies a lot of potential. So speaking on the potential, uh, quick uh, summary. Uh, these are the actual figures from the departments. 32 approved trekking trails, close to 300 kilometers in length. And despite all of that, we know that there is only one particular trek, which is the Kanchins on the base camp trek that finds mention. And um, so therein lies we see that there is, it is highly underused. Um, and of course, like I mentioned, the 150 peaks, more than those, are all in the range of 5,000 to 7,000 meters, which is quite interesting that uh, this is, this is uh, a high potential for the plantation peaks. And a quick perspective, the Everest expedition costs around $25,000 per head. A quick picture gallery of uh, tricks. And uh, I would like to conclude uh, a quick suggestion and talk on, on the impact and leverage generating capability of this particular sector. We talk about the high value and low volume. This slots right into this. Uh, it is specialized, obviously. And the natural landscape that everybody has spoken about, biodiversity, this is definitely an unfair advantage. And we would love to take more uh, uh, advantage of this, you know. And we talk about the fringe village benefits. Uh, the livelihood generating capability of this sector is immense because a lot of these areas lie in fringe villages, uh, which do not otherwise come into mainstream uh, travel and tourism, and uh, the in income generating possibility for them is extremely high. And uh, quick challenges today, of course, sustainable growth. When we look at uh, the number of figures that we have here, this is going to be a constant challenge. Uh, seasonality, which is always there, uh, because we are a holiday destination. We are not uh, able to service throughout the year. So a lot of the chunk of the visitors come in particular months in the year. Uh, of course, we are fragile young mountains. And when I talk about border areas, I'm sorry I'm rushing a bit because I know we are short on time. Uh, when we talk about border areas, there are a lot of uh, permit formalities, not for the customer, but generally for us in the private sector. And these are challenges, and we are working closely with the government, and we are happy to see that we are moving forward. 
Uh, and to conclude, I, I would like to just talk about certain aspirations because this is an August gathering here. Uh, firstly, we know that the impact of homestays on library generation is immense. Uh, but we would love to collaborate and find partners, if possible, uh, that we can do a baseline study on this to understand what is the actual impact that the homestay movement in Sikkim has been having. So, well, I, like I said, I think we are short on time, but uh, that being said, I think uh, the quick, quick uh, concluding, uh, concluding points, we know that tourism is the main industry in Sikkim. Uh, everybody benefits from it and everybody is dependent on it. And I would like to conclude also saying that mass tourism is not to be vilified because we know that this is the main driver of tourism today here in, in Sikkim. But the idea would be to find a balance between this and the new sectors that I talked about in high value and low impact. And the opportunity clearly lies in the rural sector. We are a small state. We've been really effective in uh, uh, creating some heartbreaking stories ahead. And I'm sure we can do that with travel and tourism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gelsen, for your interesting uh, presentation and for speaking within the time frame. <coughs> May I request the next speaker to kindly speak within five to seven minutes. We are cutting down the time frame given to the speakers from 10 minutes to five minutes. Moving on. May I now call upon Dr. S. Anbaladan, Chief Executive Officer, Sikkim Organic Farming Development Agency, Department of Agriculture, Department of Sikkim, to share his views on organic farming. Good afternoon to all of you. Even before this uh, meeting, when I was given this lot of uh, talking on, speaking on organic farming, I was told I just have 10 minutes. So it, it is really difficult to uh, speak on something that spans over more than two decades. So I would uh, start with this. So I would like to skip whatever happened over two decades and uh, the first statement is uh, where I would like to start. Currently we are the first and only organic farming state, certified organic farming state and it is the only continuous area in the world. No other state has such an area which is continuous. There are states in the country which have, uh, which have 10 times more organic area but they are not continuous. So this is an advantage and uh, the organic integrity lies in Sikkim. And uh, we have certified our land as per the NPOP standards, which, is, which has equivalency with the European standards. And uh, in Sikkim, we have uh, almost all the crops that can be grown, you name it, you have it. From cereals to pulses, to spices, fruits, vegetables, it can be grown. But the issue is we do have very little area under each of these uh, commodities. So this is an issue, but we have plans to overcome this, and that's what I'm going to uh, discuss. Okay. So after having achieved uh, the organic farming status, we did introspect and. Uh, we wanted to improve the livelihoods of the farmers. Of course, uh, conservation of biodiversity was one of the one of the objects. But on the other side, we also uh, looked into the livelihoods of the farmers. And in simple terms, very simple terms, we wanted our farmers to produce, and we wanted those commodities to reach the markets. So this is what uh, we are. Uh, to be good. So the, after the analysis, what we found was over the past 20 years, the organic farming movement started in the year 2003. And currently, uh, we are on a platform where we can catapult ourselves into the global market. So what we found, we, uh, found was that we were concentrating more on the production side policies and better post harvest management or the marketing side policies the territory. Again, we, after the introspection, we also found ourselves in deep trouble because our area is very limited. 
extensive agriculture is not possible, which means we cannot bring more area under cultivation. Whatever area we have, we need to either improve the productivity or uh, improve, the, improve the production and productivity. This is the only way we have to go about. The other way is add value to whatever we have. So we found that the option two was uh, is better. And we have started focusing on the marketing side policies. Basically, which means we are going to value add or process our commodities and launch it into the markets. So the way forward, we have uh, devised policies to create value chain, starting from production, assisting the farmers in production, and the government will intervene in the post harvest management activities, so that includes processing, branding, and marketing. And for this purpose, we have uh, identified a few crops, which are uh, high value crops. As I told you, we can produce any, any commodity, cereals, millets, but we have very little area under those commodities. So those, and most of them are for consumptive use. Most of them get consumed within the state and very little is available for surplus. So we identified only a few crops, which are spices like ginger, turmeric, large taramon, and uh, the pseudo cereal buckwheat. And currently, we have added two crops to the list. One is the second orange and sweet peas. We will be producing them in surplus. And uh, this is available for post harvest uh, for processing for the markets. For the production part, we have organized the farmers into uh, farmers producers organizations. Where uh, currently, we have about 15 such organizations they can, which can produce uh, certified commodities. And uh, they, we have uh, we are providing assistance for them to create facilities for uh, post, uh, for processing at their level and at the central level. Uh, we have a mega project coming up, which can uh, produce about five and a half tons per hour. And uh, we have uh, ideas to launch uh, into the domestic as well as international market, so that we capture the value of our organic value. We, culti we are planning to cultivate in clusters and we have identified clusters. We are growing crops in clusters. And buckwheat currently is under 3,000 hectares. Large carbon is equal to 2,000 hectares. Ginger about 50,000 hectares. Turmeric 5,000 hectares. And uh, we can produce sufficient uh, surplus for the processing. And this is uh, uh, a snapshot of uh, the requirements, organic requirements uh, for business. Any commodity has to be certified as per the standards into which, uh, because if a commodity has to be exported to a particular country, it has to be certified as per their standards. For instance, if we have to send a commodity to the United States, it has to be certified as per the United States, the Department of Agriculture Standards, which is called NOP. And uh, having certified under one, one standard, it cannot be pushed into another country. So we need to certify, we need to work backwards and know the uh, market, know the destination, and then certify for it. Currently, we have certification as per the EU standards, which, uh, which is, uh, which means that we can send the commodities of Sikkim only to the European Union. We cannot send our commodity to the uh, United States or Australia or Canada. So if I have to send my commodity to Japan, I have to certify it as per the Japanese standards or JAS. This is a problem in organic uh, uh, business because there is no universal equivalence. Certification under Canadian standards will not take the commodity to Japan. So this is an issue, it's a global uh, issue. It is being discussed, however, there is no solution to it. So we need to know the destination of the market and then certify accordingly. And uh, our uh, analysis was based on the markets also, the focus markets. So the, the organic markets uh, in the world are only the top, I have listed only the top five, please. Those are United States, European Union, 
Canada, Great Britain, and Switzerland. So these are the top five countries that import organic commodities from, from India. So our commodities will go to these countries. We are planning to process the commodities and market it to these countries. And the form in which they go out are in the processed forms. So that is where we have shifted our focus. We are not sending fresh commodities, though there is a market for the fresh commodities. We will be adding value to the commodities. So this is where the potential lies for seeking. And uh, we also grow spices and condiments uh, which can uh, in surplus. So there is a huge potential. When we see the processed food market, we can process our uh, spices and uh, market it to the other countries. These are the four commodities. Our idea is to not just produce, but value add or process them and then package it as per the organic standards and market it to the world. So this is in short. And uh, this is where we, uh, I would like to seek your intervention to engage all the business houses with our farmers to intervene in the process of processing and value addition. And uh, you're all most welcome. And thank you. Thanks, Dr. Anbalan, for your insights. Ladies and gentlemen, we would now like to hear from the private sector on their perspectives on the core sectors. Starting with the pharmaceutical sector, I would love I would like to invite Dr. A. H. Khan, Senior Vice President, Corporate Relations, India, Regulatory Affairs and Corporate Social Responsibility, Sun Pharmaceuticals Industries Limited, for his presentation. pharmaceutical industry and the pharmaceutical industry has been one of the significant uh, economical driver for the country and the way this industry has progressed uh, from 70 onwards the growth has been very phenomenal you see this is the indian pharmaceutical industry uh, Actually, if you look at almost 20% of the world's pharmaceutical need is being met by India. Especially in the generic market, we cater to almost 20% of the We are the uh, third largest uh, producer in the world. And we are also a creator of about 2.7 million jobs for the country. And our annual turnover is around 50 billion US dollar. Some of the most significant uh, achievement of the pharmaceutical industries is if we take a baseline of 1990 and uh, there was a study conducted uh, treating the baseline from 1990 to 2016, the affordability and the availability of Indian uh, for medicines have been able to reduce the uh, disease burden in the country by 36%. So this has been a uh, very significant uh, achievement. India has been able to eradicate 100% polio through its all immediately manufactured vaccine. So all the vaccines uh, used in the polio eradication were all made in India. And we are also meeting the 60% of vaccine demand across the world. Uh, in US, every three out, uh, one out of three pill which is being consumed in US is 
made out of India. If we see our journey, how pharmaceutical industry has evolved, uh, in pre-1970, uh, I think almost everything was we were dependent on import. But from 1970, today we are exporting to about 220 countries. And we are world's uh, most uh, reliable supplier of pharmaceuticals during, uh, even uh, during the crisis period of COVID. The very unprecedented uh, human crisis, uh, which the, all of us faced, the entire world faced, was about COVID. So India also was not an exception to it. We had almost 45 million uh, COVID cases in India, and uh, we have been able to uh, create our own uh, vaccine. And uh, so far, I think we have uh, administered about 2.1 billion doses of uh, vaccine uh, manufactured in India. During the COVID period, I think that was one of the major uh, achievement of pharmaceutical industry that during the COVID, uh, crisis of COVID, there has been no shortage of drugs. Even we continue to supply the drugs like hydroxychloroquine, uh, the drugs like methyl uh, prednisolone, all those drugs continue to be supplied not only to the, within the uh, country, but we continue to serve the other countries in terms of supplies. And a uh, lot of, lot of uh, appreciation to the state governments which were very much helpful in making our manufacturing uh, plants uh, run 24 by 7 because if the manufacturing sites would not have been able to produce, naturally there would have been shortage of supplies after. I think uh, some of the major uh, initiatives taken by the government are very, very uh, laudable, uh, very appreciable, and one of the very important uh, initiative, which is uh, in fact driven by the Prime Minister uh, himself, uh, is the uh, attaining self-reliance in the field of basically API and key starting materials. Uh, keeping in mind achieving the self-reliance of the country. Uh, the government of India has announced the production link scheme and this scheme we are very confident that will definitely make us self-reliant in terms of meeting our demand of API and other things. Innovation is another very important uh, agenda on the uh, government. The government is very uh, seriously thinking on how uh, we all 